In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Today's gospel resonates with me for many reasons, but largely because it is such a full and layered epiphany, a light bulb going off in many different ways. It beautifully connects the past, the hopes of all those generations who have been waiting for this Messiah, this anointed one, while foreshadowing not just the passion of Jesus, but the complex relationship Jesus has with this very place, the temple. I think when connected to Jesus' other temple stories, it paints a pretty vivid picture of what church should be and shouldn't be. I know we are not the temple, but I think we can gleam a lot from Jesus' relationship with the temple. So the law stated that 40 days after the birth of a male child, 50 for a female child, a woman was deemed clean, and likely the viability and health of the child uh, was clear. They would bring the child to the tent, or in later days, the temple. When Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple for the first time to present this newborn child to God, two wise elders immediately knew that this was no ordinary child. Simeon, a devout man of prayer for whom God assured that he would live long enough to see the Messiah, and Anna, who had been a widow for nearly three-fourths of her life, dependent on the temple probably for just about everything. So she lived there day and night. She might possibly have some remaining family members that may help her with her survival, but not likely. And what I love about the story is that's not how they lead. They don't lead by describing Anna as a woman of poor, uh, a, a, a widow, a woman uh, without means, a woman dependent on the church award of the temple. They describe her this way. She is presented as a prophet, the prophet Anna, with dignity not always provided to the poor or the broken. Both see this child and proclaim what God has opened up to them, that this is the child that generations of folks have been waiting for, some for centuries before they were ever born. But they also paint more of the picture and I love, I love that song of Simeon. I love what it says. I love the spirit of it. Um, but it leaves out some important lines. This next, this next bit. This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your soul too. This is the one, but allegiance to the one is going to have cost. I think of that moment and reflect on one of the most meaningful aspects of church to me. I've said many times uh, what a gift it's been to be someone who's moved around 20 times and uh, almost never either on the same coast or within hours of a grandparent. Nobody knew my story. Uh, nobody uh, saw me when I was a baby and knew me and watched me grow up to adulthood. So the church was the only place that I got that multi-generational investment. Uh, the only place where I heard World War II stories uh, from the, uh, the elders in the parish, or I heard about the way that the church used to be, uh, or that I saw people several times my age investing in me, uh, uh, grateful for my service as an acolyte, uh, teaching me uh, the tenets of the church in formation. It was the biggest gift the church provided to me during my rather transitory childhood. And it wasn't a community that I found many other places. The fullness of the body of Christ is pivotal. This is a gathering, places that, a gathering place that spans generations where wisdom and story are passed down, where we invest in one another, uh, where we gain new perspective, new vitality and youth and new wisdom. And so what an occasion to celebrate Richard Gukin and, her, and his faithful co-editor Connie Lyons and their publishing of the History of St. James, a publication uh, that not 
only went out of here quickly but never even had time to hit the shelves. Uh, went from box uh, into people's hands and out the door faster than any new Harry Potter sequel. <laughs> Thank you for being that teller of our story, that sharer of our wisdom, that person that collected our collective history, our collective story for generations to come so we can continue to be that reflection. This is also a place where our oldest members pledge to support our infants and adults alike as they are welcomed into the body of Christ through baptism. This year we baptize 16 new members and each time we pledge to share our wisdom, our faith, to help this beloved child of God, no matter their age, to grow into the full stature of Christ. We also supported 40 plus youth and adults as they claimed that identity and confirmation and reception. And in the spring we had more than 20 of our younger early elementary children participate in a communion class to fully understand the gift that they receive. They baked the bread and we shared and acknowledged this is a special moment in their walk of faith. This is a place not only where we gather across generations, but where we honor and acknowledge God's presence and hand in the fullness of life, from birth, marriage, sickness, and in death, and in the promise to new life. And I cannot begin to express my gratitude for the way that we take care of one another in those most meaningful and most difficult moments. The work of our bereavement committee, the incredible number of hands that go in and so quickly uh, jump to volunteer, to serve, to take care, to help in any way possible. And the absolutely remarkable gift of Jesse and this choir uh, in front of you dropping everything, even learning new music, to honor those difficult but holy moments and those beloved people in our lives. We also gather for those significant moments in the church here. Every year during Jesus' childhood, we read that his parents would pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover. On our holiest of days in 2019, we celebrated with beautiful, beautiful liturgies with powerful music that evoked the spirit and tone of every given service. The number of people who lent a hand between Palm Sunday, where we carefully prepared to tell the passion story in a new and more intentional way, through Easter was jaw-dropping. The same goes for Advent to Christmas. Some up front, many more behind the scenes, organizing volunteers, including our acolytes and servers, setting the altar, adorning the church, greeting, recording, ushering, looking over bulletins, you name it. That is so much part of the beauty of us walking through the story is that we walk through the story together, all lending our hands. I don't know that I can look upon a year and be prouder of the work that we have done in moving through the church year in ordinary time and during the holiest of occasions. Again, the choir and music ministries work, whether setting us on the way during Lent with that sung Compline that was so beautiful, or during our celebration of All Saints in concert with St. Stephen's Culpepper with Evensong, the beginning of Advent with the beautiful lessons and carols, our collaborative Christmas concert with many area churches, or the work during these Holy Week and Christmas liturgies that have heightened our senses and enhanced our worship. At 12 years old, Jesus' family travels to the temple for Passover. Do you remember that story? And as they return home, as they're making their way back to Nazareth, after they've had a long day of travel and they set up camp for the night, Mary and Joseph realize that Jesus isn't there. Where is Jesus? And in their hysteria, they run practically all the way back to Jerusalem. And they spend three days, as a parent, can you imagine, spent three days looking for their child. And where do they find him? Of course, he's in the temple. Where else would you expect to find me but in my father's house? In his father's house, learning about God and God's word. Formation for God's children of all ages is robust here at St. James. I express, and I know all of us express, a tremendous gratitude for Father Randolph and his adult formation team, 
for Scott and Joanne in their work with EFM, for Jen and her faithful teachers and youth leaders, for our nursery attendants, for Stacy and our school staff. It has been a robust year. This year, Children's Church has been booming with energy. I mentioned our communion instruction that we offered this year for the first time. By all reports, I was on sabbatical, but I heard countless, countless reports of what an exciting and full and joyful Vacation Bible School we had after taking a year off with construction the year before. And Jen needs to be lauded for her leadership. For our middle and high school youth groups that continue to forge deep, deep friendships and grow in faith together. For the confirmation work, including a two-hour session with Bishop Ted. I give thanks for our school and the formation that takes place there. One of the most intentional places of formation, not just here at St. James, uh, but probably throughout the diocese or the larger church. Through age-appropriate worship and chapel, classroom instruction, creative storytelling, a focus on monthly virtues and the biblical antecedent for each virtue, it is rich and it's not happening other places. And we ought to celebrate the incredible work that Stacy Irvin, our head of school, has done over the past 10 years as we acknowledge 10 years of faithful and sacrificial service to St. James and our adult offerings. Not always a strength of ours here at St. James, uh, but now certainly something to tout. On Monday, we have our men's spiritual development group. On Tuesday, our morning uh, women's group. On Wednesday, our EFM, our education for ministry group. On Wednesday night, once a month, get hoppy, get holy. On Thursdays, our bishop service, followed uh, by our uh, lectionary-based discussion with the bishop. And once a month, that group and several others come in and they have a book study. And then on Sunday, we have two adult ed offerings uh, between the services and after the services. And in during Lent, uh, Sunday evenings we spent together talking about how we raise our children uh, and our grandchildren with a lens of faith. It is robust. And this part doesn't quite fit as neatly into the discussion of the temple, but most certainly does into the life and ministry of Jesus. How we are cultivating community here. Community, fellowship, breaking bread together was the core to Jesus and his followers. It is what bound them. It is what gave them dignity and wholeness. It is how they knew how beloved they were by God through Jesus Christ. Uh, it is that miracle of all miracles uh, that God uses to bind people together and show God's uh, abundance, holding them together in the breaking of the, uh, of the bread and the fish. Uh, it is how we relate to one another, learn about each other, grow towards one another, and share in one another in our joys and in our laughter so that when we have our sorrows and our struggles, we know where we can go. It bonds us. It holds us. The work of our new fellowship team has been phenomenal. The parish picnic, our uh, certainly enhanced uh, Mardi Gras celebration, the reestablishment of our Episcopal church women, weekly cafe, the, the incredible work of the youth groups, uh, softball, and, and uh, as important as softball and time in the dugout uh, and time on the field is uh, the beer and burger afterwards at Foster's where people who have been worshiping together for years said they had their first meaningful conversation and really got to know each other, uh, really got to find out what they had in common and start bending their lives towards each other. So when they see each other at church, it's more than a uh, across the pew hello. Uh, it's critical. It doesn't seem as much like ministry, but it is critical, critical work. And it is uh, work that Jesus undertook. And the many other ways that we share our lives together. It's worth noting that Jesus came to the temple to worship, to commune with God, to learn more about God, uh, to be with those that dedicated their lives to God, but he also retreated. He needed solitude and rejuvenation. He needed fortitude for the journey ahead, and he went into the wilderness. And despite rumors from last Sunday that I look a lot like Jesus, I am absolutely not Jesus, uh, but I am incredibly grateful that you all gave me that season to do the same, uh, to walk away and rejuvenate and fill my sails. I am beyond grateful for our sabbatical, uh, for uh, the time to get away, 
for the generosity that you all provided in making it possible for all the hands that went into carrying the church over the past summer. But it was a time where I could enjoy my family uh, without interruption, where I could commune with God in a less hurried way, where I could be more intentional about each hour of my day, where I could read more, listen to podcasts, uh, just have more time to myself, where I could travel and see this great country. An incredible thanks to the generosity of the whole congregation, to the collective work for the staff who dug in deeper, especially for Randolph who guided us uh, through that season so nimbly and so faithfully, uh, for the wardens and their extra work for Bob Irving and his care of our plant during that season, uh, for a, a time for us to see how many gifts uh, we have uh, in the midst of us. And there's another side to this. Missed to this passage, missed in a very straight reading of today's gospel. There's a part that you could read it again and again and not pick up on. For the presentation of a child, scripture says a lamb in its first year was expected as a burnt offering, and a turtle dove and pigeon as a sin offering. If, if you could not afford a lamb, which is likely for sale outside of the temple, you could give a hardship offering of two turtle doves and two pigeons, as we have referred to in today's passage. So even as the Son of God, even as the, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the child that people waited generations to come, was presented to God in the temple, the Son of God to God on, on high, even as he was presented, there was a twinge of shame that Mary and Joseph had to present him with a poor person's offering. It's not the last time shame around money or a lack of full inclusion enters Jesus' conscience in regards to the temple. The story of the widow's might, his infuriation over the money changers, and the exclusion of the broken down, the lepers, the sinners, the unlike us, the others, all of that tore Jesus apart. Jesus desperately wanted people to see God's wide open embrace, that absolutely no wall could contain God, and absolutely no wall should ever keep people away from the God that made them, that loves them, that is working in their lives towards redemption and wholeness. If the temple of God should look like that wide embrace, no one is outside of those arms. No one is held less tightly. As a church, that's our charge as well. Our inclusion, our ability to break down barriers and differences, our ability to not just care for, but walk with all of God's children, to see people like Anna for the prophet they are and not the poor dependent widow is passionately important to Jesus. And we do, in so many ways, do this, and we have so many ways in which we have more work to do. I'd like to commend our welcome ministries, from our greeter team to our ushers to our invite welcome connect team to the folks that have worked tirelessly uh, adapting to our new database and realm so that uh, we can continue to more fully invite people in and once they're in uh, this space, more fully let them know that they are valued and are a critical part of the body of Christ and equipped for ministry uh, and engaged uh, in the life of the church. And our relationship with First Baptist, as we pray together, as we walk through the streets of Warrington together, as we worship together, as we have difficult conversations around race and racism, as we work together, we break down divisions within our own hearts, divisions we may not have even known existed. We claim truths or we confront truths, and we become a more inclusive and full representation of not just the church and the body of Christ, but of God's open, wide embrace. Our learning starts early ministry that enables students who, because of economics, would not be able to attend our preschool, are able to be here without distinction, to be a full part of our preschool program being formed and shaped and equipped to thrive all the way through with their peers, not distinct from them. Our reading program with Head Start is a ministry with 
God's beloved children. It's definitely worth noting that Learning Starts Early became an independent entity this year and also was graced with a visit, a very complimentary visit from the First Lady of Virginia because of what we were exemplifying to the rest of the Commonwealth, the public-private partnership uh, that we have been able to forge, uh, and uh, along with that, a quarter of a million dollar grant for Fauquier County uh, to continue to do that important, important work. This all started a dream from this place. So many more ministries done with dignity and respect, free clinic, breakfast sandwiches, wood ministry, St. James Builds, sponsorships of students in Haiti and Uganda, the work of our green team, and so, so much more. And all this in a sabbatical year, and I didn't even mention that UVA won the national championship <laughs> and the Nats won the World Series. Okay, I had to drop that in. That's it. But there's a lot more that we need to do. That question should burn on us. Where are we like the temple uh, in the, the, the place that Jesus so loved to commune, where Jesus felt so formed uh, and so nourished uh, in, in understanding of whose he was, and where do we fall short? Where are we a closed body? Where do we have work to be done to fully reflect those outstretched hands? I think we need to be more welcoming. Without changing our core identity of who we are as a worshiping body, we need to realize that more and more people are not formed inside churches in their childhood, and they come in with no narrative, uh, and our worship is somewhat foreign. How do we continue to be who we are and welcome people who are different? Uh, different in terms of what, how they were raised, different in terms of where they came from, of their uh, income levels, uh, all those differences that beautify that body. How do we more fully welcome and incorporate into, into our lives? I've been daily, uh, as many of you have heard, uh, trying to teach myself Spanish, which is a tall task because that languages have never come easily. Uh, but every day on Duolingo, and I'm spending uh, the remaining uh, uh, bits of my sabbatical and continuing ed time uh, to go to uh, Honduras uh, for a couple week immersion uh, to try to uh, be able uh, to be a more welcoming presence to what often is an invisible part of our county that is all around us. Just this week, uh, a woman came in desperate for financial assistance, uh, uh, flustered, trying to figure out how to communicate, unable to put together the words. And it just happened to be the one day of the week uh, that the Spanish teacher downstairs uh, was here. And I was able to go and get her and bring her up. Um, but we can do more, and we can do it better. We can figure out ways uh, to look a little bit more boldly at Fauquier County and see what we sometimes look over and meet those needs. I think we desperately need to keep that organizational structure, that strong uh, lay leadership that Randolph has helped put into place. Uh, and uh, it's going to require a lot more hands. It's going to require folks stepping up and continuing the work that they've been equipped to do and empowered to do. Uh, it will be a long time before we have, as you heard in the financial meeting, um, uh, in our annual meeting, it'll be a long time before we will have full-time clergy coverage uh, uh, in addition to myself. Uh, we are blessed that Ted is offering his gifts. Uh, this is also his fourth retirement, his fourth gig out of retirement. So, um, so we, we are understaffed, but we can do it. And it will require you to, to do that work and continue that organizational structure that allows us to make sure that we reach uh, everyone. And to that end, our Stephen Ministry uh, group is working to re-envision how they understand themselves, that not only will we have Stephen Ministry, uh, but we will have a broader pastoral care team so that nobody who claims St. James is their home uh, will ever feel like they've been dropped for any reason, uh, that we will try uh, uh, absolutely ardently to make sure their needs are met and they know that they're in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. We need to support the school. No church can do what the school does. They are here Monday through Friday. They make us a seven day of the week. Uh, those doors, the front doors, side doors, and all the doors in between probably open and close uh, more than just about any church or any institution uh, in this area. And it is a source not just of pride, uh, but it is a source of transformation in this community and beyond. Uh, and we have to protect that. Um, we have to dig in deeper and invest in it. We also need to grow our resources. As you heard in our meeting, uh, we need to grow our endowment, our planned giving. We need to lay a foundation 
uh, so that uh, we can protect this campus uh, and this plant so that we can use our annual resources to do the work that we're called to do, the work that's been so described uh, in this past year. And we need to keep working on that million dollar question. How do we be the kind of worshiping community and support one another uh, with all of the exigencies pulling against us? How do we meet the needs of those who have five different things going on on Saturday and Sunday, uh, who are exhausted from commuting into the Beltway, uh, who's got travel soccer or travel baseball or uh, dance or, uh, or, or swimming? How do we meet those needs and continue to be the community that we need to be uh, so that absolutely, whenever we're dependent upon, people know that we're there? How do we continue to be a seven day a week community? And I think we need to dream. Just as Jesus dreamed about what the temple could be, uh, about what it would be like if each of us knew that God resided inside of us, the church needs to dream. We've realized so many dreams. Uh, we have a, a beautiful school wing that we didn't have. Uh, we have uh, a, a vibrant and organized outreach uh, and our Learning Starts, uh, Starts Early program that we developed out of, uh, out of nothing but our talents and our passions. We have a vibrant adult formation uh, committee. We are connected in ways that we weren't before. What is our new dream? What is the dream that God has for us? We take deep breaths and discern where God is calling us next and start laying the foundation to get there. So I invite you, think about this temple that God has given us. Think about the wonderful things that take place within these walls. Think about where those arms, those loving arms of God, need to be opened wider for the whole world. Amen.